Yeah, so I've been talking about character and how important character is in our lives and in other people's lives. Uh, I talked about uh, it, it's supposed to reflect the image of God, actually, in our lives. Character, that was two weeks ago. Last week I talked about building up character. But you know there's an enemy of our souls, the Bible says. There's, there is an influence seeking to ruin your character. And oftentimes we face that uh, battle in temptation. And so today I want us to take a few minutes to consider temptation. Now, I'm going to jump to the end for a second and say that's not really supposed to be our focus. Okay? There's a different focus, and we'll get to that. But we can't ignore temptation either. Temptation reaches us all. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways like we are, and yet he didn't sin. So now some people, I actually had that question brought up in a theological class I'm part of, and, and we're discussing, you know, well, when it says every temptation, does it mean like every temptation? And really it means all kinds of, right? So... Um, maybe somebody here or online has struggled with drug addiction in the past and um, you know maybe it's been crack cocaine or methamphetamines or something like that well those things didn't exist in Jesus's time so obviously it doesn't mean every temptation in that sense but was Jesus tempted maybe to drink a little too much Jesus was tempted in all ways like us we all have different kinds of temptations that come our way. And, and so, and there's, there's the emotional side of temptation. There's the physical side of temptation. There's all sorts of areas. And I'm not going to, really, this could be a whole huge discussion on temptation. But I believe God has some, some things for us to consider about temptation and how we can uh, really bucket, really resist it, and, and kick it off even. In our lives so that we don't necessarily have to be tempted all the time the way we have been in our lives and that's part of growing in God um, with Jesus's temptation uh, his enemy there is referred by two different names it starts off talking about about him as the devil and in the Greek the word is diabolos right which means actually slanderer now here's somebody who lies to us, lies to us about, and often temptation is a lie. Temptation says you can satisfy something, this desire in you, in a wrong way, right? It's, it's a lie. It's either lying about the desire that you have a wrong desire, or it's lying how you can fulfill that desire, because not all desires are wrong. It's good to desire food. It's good to have, you know, taste buds and enjoy food and stuff like that. It is uh, not so good to satisfy that need <laughs> by eating too much food, um, which I've seriously worked on in my life um, and continue to seriously work on. So um, yesterday was a big candy kind of day. There was lots of chocolate kicking around my house and uh, I posted a thing on Facebook asking, you know, what's your favorite candy this time of year? And there's all sorts of different chocolate bars and candy and stuff like that. And my favorite's Coffee Crisp. So, um, you know, but unfortunately, so is my son's favorite thing. So we just have this battle as to who can get, you know, which before they all disappear. Uh, and I noticed other people were the same way as they were responding on Facebook. Uh, the other thing that he is called is Satan, which means adversary. We have somebody who's working against us in our lives to bring temptations our way. So, you know, like I said, not all temptations are wrong. It's just wrong ways of meeting those. I'm not phrasing that right. Not all desires are wrong. The way we meet those things sometimes are a temptation to sin. But... Also, we do have somebody who's trying to influence us in a negative sense and generate negative and, and proper desires in our lives as well. And Jesus was faced with all that. 
So a couple things about Corinth before we read this passage uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to them. Corinth was a capital city of a province, and it had been a hugely successful and wealthy city during Greek times, and in the first century, about midway where Paul is writing this letter, they're a key Roman city too, and they have a lot of trade and commerce and tourism going on. It's a center of different kinds of worship. It's a center for all sorts of stuff. In fact, one uh, commentator, Gordon Fee, said it's like New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas packed into one. It's that kind of a city. And so, as you can imagine, there will be a lot of temptations they're facing. And when we get to reading here in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul addresses a lot of these issues that are going on in the church and the temptations they've been facing and failing at in different ways. And so I'm just going to give a little lead up in verses 6 to 10 here. Um, it's not going to be on your screen, but I wanted to give it as a lead in. And he's talking first at the beginning of chapter 10 about uh, Israel and what Israel went through uh, in their past. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must put, not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer as some of them did. And, and really, Paul is weaving in as some of you are doing in your life, grumbling, being tempted with immorality, you know, gluttony, all sorts of things going on that, that Paul is, is addressing here. So what do we do with this? Now, we'll get to verse 13, which some of you probably have heard before. But we need to lead into it properly. And so we'll start at verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. We have an example in Scripture. You don't have to learn everything the hard way. I don't know how many things, you know, I chose in life to learn the hard way instead of listening to the wisdom of my elders. Maybe you can think of a few examples in your life. <laughs> and Paul's saying, look, things have happened in other people's past. You don't have to allow it to be in your life. Look at what happened to them. They grumbled, they complained, they sinned, they paid for it. You don't have to do that. There are positive examples, and Paul talks about that in Corinthians 2. He says, follow me in the same way that I'm following Jesus Christ. But he says, look, there are bad examples too. There's failures we should learn from and not repeat the failures. Some have said, you know, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. And there are histories in people's lives. There's histories in people's families. Sometimes there are things that the Bible calls generational sin things that have carried through because nobody bothered to learn from it and take it to God and overcome those things. And so temptation comes in that way, and he says, look, there are examples here of people who have failed. Why don't we learn from that? Don't just try and ride it all out on your own. Um, I've got to be careful because these things sort of weave together here, and I was just about to jump into the next part, which is verse 12, which talks about ego. So we have example, negative, and we have ego that's in our way in dealing with temptation too. Verse 12, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So we can get all high and mighty and go, well, yeah, look at them. And Paul's saying, whoa, you better be careful. You know, if you're sitting on your high horse, it's a long way down to the ground. And if you come at things with pride, 
with this sense of self assurance and and that you know I'm better than that you know the saying goes therefore but by the grace of God go I you know like it's it's possible for all of us to fall we have this example for us to learn from but it's not an example that we can just stand in pride against and say nah the Apostle John in his first letter that he wrote to some churches and and not his gospel but later on in our New Testament in verse 8 of first John chapter 1 it says if we claim we have no sin we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth right and that's that devil word again deceiver slanderer there's this sense in which we deceive ourselves we we align ourselves with our own enemy by saying yeah that can't happen to me yeah I'm above that you know it's true that not everyone is tempted in the same way exactly um, so I know some people that really don't like sweets so the whole candy issue from yesterday is not a problem for them at all but it doesn't mean they're not tempted by other things that go in their mouth right so there's there's identically the same and then there's in the same category of temptation and if we think we can't be tempted and if we think that we have not sinned and cannot sin because we're following God and Jesus is my best friend you know I think of that Norman Greenbaum song spirit in the sky you know and he, and he, he has a lie in there I think he was trying to have a Christian -y kind of song in the time of the Jesus movement and stuff but you know I have no sin only because Jesus has forgiven me of my sins not because I cannot sin and if we pursue God we can overcome sin and temptation and I'm gonna to get to that but at the same time we can't say you know I'm above all these things don't let ego get in your way two verses later verse 10 John writes if we claim we have not sinned we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts so when the Bible says that you know you will be tempted and we have been tempted and you try and sort of just shut that off you're saying no God's lying about that that's a pretty dangerous place to be in your ego and pride are in the road so we have examples to learn from we have an ego to keep check on and then of course it's everyone no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man 1 Corinthians 10 13 the first part of it it's common and so on that side of things we can also have reassurance that we can look at one another and not be so proud and say you know I struggle you struggle we all struggle why don't we encourage one another why don't we help one another why don't we support one another uh, I remember uh, oh, what was his name now it slipped me uh, late 70s early 80s there was a Christian song called don't shoot the wounded and um, his name is gonna come to me at like 4 o'clock in the morning and I'm gonna wake up to it but it's it's true that sometimes in church circles sadly we have shot our wounded people have been shot down with temptation and we have decided to step all over them and and not help them out and in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 the Apostle Paul writes look if you find somebody who's fallen to temptation you who are spiritual restore them reach out across and help them back up Solomon in his wisdom wrote you know it's better for two people to walk together than for one person to walk alone why because if one person falls the other one can help them up and that's supposed the way it's supposed to be in the family of God the way it's supposed to be on the planet that God created is really what it's supposed to be but we've fallen into our sin and temptations and we lose track of the commonality and sometimes we get this us and them mentality 
when it's really every one of us need the grace of God. And not only that, sometimes when we struggle with temptation and fall in temptation, and I don't know if you face this at times, but I have, but we feel all alone. We can feel like I'm the only one going through this ever. And it isolates us from the very help that we need. But Paul's saying, look, it's all common. Yeah, you're a unique person facing a unique circumstance in a unique way, but it's common. You're not the only person to struggle with overeating. You're not the only person to struggle with, struggle with lying. You're not the only person to ever struggle with uh, addiction. You're not the only person to struggle with whatever it is that you're tempted by. You are not alone. There are others. And even if you haven't experienced it exactly the same way, it doesn't mean you don't have something positive to say and to do for somebody else because we've all been tempted. And we've all had to overcome temptation. At least I hope we're overcoming temptation. And we're going to talk about that too. That's next. So the second part of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, this is the part, I mean, a lot of people have heard this verse and read this verse, and I've heard Christians share this verse. God won't give you anything more than you're able to handle. That's out of context, usually, the way they're applying that. In its context, he's talking about temptation. He's saying, look, we all get tempted, and there's a way for us to endure it and get out of it without sinning. We don't have to sin. We don't have to fall to temptation. We have Jesus on our side who was tempted in every way and yet overcame it all. And then if you read the next verse, that's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Um, yeah. Verse 16 says, And we can run to the throne of God, the, the throne of grace, to get the help we need in time of need. So Jesus was tempted in all ways like us, and we can run to God. Our way of escape isn't just fleeing temptation. And Paul talks about that in, earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, verse 18, and he's talking about uh, sexual temptation, and he says, flee it, run away from it. But so often in our lives, we try and just run away from. And if we don't know what we're running to, we somehow circle back to the very thing we were running away from. I don't know if you faced that in your life. Where it's just like, I'm running away from this food, but there's another restaurant and another restaurant and an there's another convenience store with candy. There's another dollar store with cheap candy. There's, we, we all face temptation. And if all we do is flee without fleeing to, we all circle back around. Because it's an aimless fleeing. Temptation will find you out again. The way of escape isn't just fleeing from, but fleeing to. And so just like I said in, in Hebrews 4, it's run to the throne of God. We run to God in our lives. Later on in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So he says, yes, we need to let go of the sin, let go of the temptation, get past that, but we have to run toward Jesus. The way of escape is not just fleeing from, but fleeing to. And I think that's sort of the, the half part of the message that Jesus came to give that we somehow run into trouble with. 
We think that Jesus just came to forgive us of our sins by dying on a cross for us. But that's only half the story. That's just Good Friday. You still need Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. You know, the, the Good Friday part we need. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, we need that part. We need Jesus to die for us and forgive us of our sins. But if that is it, then where is the freedom and life and joy that God intends for us to be living? And moving forward in. That's where we need to be going. He provides us an exit. That's the other E words. If you had noticed, the, this sermon's brought to you by the letter E today. Um, but God gives us an exit. You don't have to sit in that temptation. We can run from that and run to God and find what we need. And running to God doesn't just mean getting on our knees and praying. Because there's lots of people that have got on our knees and prayed that this temptation would leave them without success. Running to God also means running to God's people. Because the Bible says, and, and Paul says it here in Romans, if you read on into chapter 12, that we are the body of Christ. That together, we are supposed to be the expression of who Jesus is on the earth. As Christians. As church. That the running to God is also running to God's people, God's body, so that we can have the strength we need with one another. And as I was reading over and over again, it really, it's, it's really about the strength we can have together in all this. Paul is not, so often in scripture, you read you and you think that he's talking about you. But that's the limitation of our English. Often the you that gets written in the New Testament in all these letters is you plural. All of you. All y'all. Or if you're from like certain sections of Ontario, yous. Use people, right? That, that, that we're supposed to be looking into this together, not just individually. And the great thing about looking to Jesus, looking to God, is you can't look at your temptation while you're doing that. You can't look two ways at once. We are not like a fish that has something on both sides of its head, you know, like a flounder. <laughs> Isn't that the fish? Maybe I'm thinking it wrong. Maybe some East Coasters can help me. But, you know, like there are fish that have a, like they look two directions at once. I don't get how they live, but we're not designed that way. We're designed to look like that, to focus. And, and if you're focusing on God with God's people together, temptation starts to disappear. It's the way of escape, the exit that God designed for us. Skipping a little bit to verses 23 and 24 here. And so just a, a moment of, if you're, if you're reading through your Bible and, and looking at scripture, there are things to watch for. Here's just a little Bible reading moment. Um, verse 6 starts with, now these things... And then he talks about these sins that went on with Israel. And then you get to verse 11. Now these things. So if you're reading along and paying attention, there are indicators to help us to read. And so he brackets that little area of, of example. And then he goes on to talk about this stuff. And then he goes, therefore, in verse 14, and then repeats this sort of, example again how we can overcome temptation with different things and then we get to verse 23 all things are lawful but not all things are helpful all things are lawful but not all things build up and that's the struggle we have with temptation sometimes is we can go 
Oh, there's nothing wrong with food. I need food, you need food, we all need food. If you stop the food thing for very long, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> we are designed to eat, and, and that's necessary for our health. But we are not designed to overeat. That's not good for our health. And so Paul says, you know, so often in our lives, we look at stuff that are gray areas, and we go, well, there's nothing really wrong with that. And sometimes we compare in our lives and go, well, how come they don't watch television? And I have no problem with television. Or, right, these things that are really innocuous, they're amoral, they have no real morality one way or the other, it's all in how you engage with it. Food is amoral. There's no right or wrong with food. Well, maybe Brussels sprouts. There's something wrong with that. But <laughs> my sister likes them, so um, I'm just poking over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there's, there's nothing right or wrong about that, per se. And Paul is just saying, you know, so often we put these labels on things it's as right or wrong. But the problem is not in and of itself. Even sexuality is meant to be dealt with properly and rightly within marriage. There is a right way to deal with that. And Paul addresses that a little bit in his letter here. Like, you know, if you need to get married, get married. Don't try and tough it out and, and think there's something wrong with that. And in a different uh, letter, it talks about, you know, people that were going around in the early church saying, well, you really shouldn't get married and you should devote yourself completely to God because Jesus is coming back any day and you really should just 100% focus on that. And he's like, you know, that's wrong. And so sometimes we try and deal with our temptations by labeling them as right or wrong. When really the only thing making them right or wrong is what Paul says here. Is it helpful? Is that really good? Does that do anything positive? If it's not doing anything positive, then why are you bothering to do it? What are the results that are going to come out from this? And then he set, talks about building up. And when he gets talking about the spiritual gifts, if you read in chapter 14 and go through there, he talks over and over and over again about the need to build up. If this isn't building up the church, building up the body of Christ, building people up in God, then really you've lost the focus. You've lost its purpose. Because catch what he says next in verse 24. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And that's the struggle in temptation so often, and, and improper expression of desire, is it's selfish. It fails in its selfishness. Now, it's not saying that you can't benefit from what's beneficial to your neighbor. Right? There are things that we can do with a right motive and a right heart that are good for others that's also good for us. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it's not, you know, beat yourself up like crazy so that you can love your neighbor. And then the Philippian letter, Paul says, you know, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look more towards, right, keep, keep the other people higher on your list than yourself so you don't fall into selfishness, so you don't trip over that and fail. Because is it helpful? Is it building up? Is it expedient? If you're looking for the E word now that I made it <laughs> known, is it expedient in these things? I talked about chapter 14, I'm going to just, first one of chapter 14 says this, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. There is right places to put our desires in God so that we can pursue the right things in God and, and temptation has less of a doorway in our lives because we're satisfying those desires properly. 
And when our desires are being satisfied properly, what has the devil got to tempt you with? If, if you learn to enjoy food properly and have a good relationship with your body and it's being healthy, then, you know, when you overeat, you go, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. Right? That's a proper response. Your body really shouldn't like that as soon as you're being selfish. But when you have a meal with other people and everyone just sort of enjoys it and no one's really, you know, overdoing it, everyone gets to enjoy one another because nobody's in a food coma over in the corner. Right? You get to, to really experience what God's design and desire was for that in our lives. How often was it that, that people, you, you go to their home and where was everyone talking to one another? In the kitchen. <laughs> Somehow food was involved. And that's not necessarily a negative if it's all in its right place. Is it building up? Is it helpful? God intends to strengthen our resistance so that we can buck off temptation in our lives. Let me get that clear. Buck off temptation in our lives like kick you know okay westerners rodeo kick it off by having the right things going on for us let's focus on a couple takeaways what tempts you hmm we are drawn to the temp what why are you drawn to that temptation are there wrong desires or right desires with wrong solutions? Because desire in our life isn't necessarily wrong. I read you that verse in 1 Corinthians 14.1. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. There's, there's things to rightly desire in our lives. Desire is not wrong. In fact, in the Psalms, it says, you know, God would grant us the desires of our heart. But it also says that in the context of us aligning our hearts with God. And so when our hearts are aligned with his, our desires are right. And then we find the right solutions to those desires, the right ways of meeting those desires. And we're not tempted to stray from that. But James, the brother of Jesus, said, don't say any time that, you know, God tempts you. Just own up to the fact that it's your evil desires that allow you to be tempted. So what tempts you? And why? It's important for us to be mindful in those moments of temptation. To be aware, self-aware of the fact that something in me is being tempted. Why? Because the solution to that will grow you in your relationship with God. What's your exit strategy? Do you have an exit strategy? Right? Are you self-aware enough to know when temptation starts? Sometimes, you know, we figure out, oh, I'm being tempted. But you're already, like, way down the road of temptation. Because you weren't being aware of yourself enough and paying attention to what was going on in your heart. Because you were tempted way back there when you took a left turn. You're already so far down that road. It's a little bit later in the process. It's a lot better and easier if you figure it out when you're at the turn. Hey, wait a minute. I shouldn't be going this way. <laughs> and straighten out. Do you know how to run to God in those moments of temptation? Even Jesus had to run to his Father in moments of temptation. And I... I highly doubt any of us have been tempted to the point where we're sweating drops of blood in our lives. Because Jesus faced temptation on that level. So we can go to Jesus, and we can go to our brothers and sisters, pursuing God together to overcome these things. But do you have an exit strategy? Do you have somebody you can turn to in your moments of temptation? Let's see, you know, I'm really struggling today. And, and walk that out together. People who are going through 12-step programs have mentors, have 
somebody that they're connected with so that they can contact them in their moments of temptation. Our problem is, we look at that and we get back to the ego problem. I go, oh, I don't need that in my life. Are you kidding? We're all addicted to sin. Okay? We all face temptation. Who do you have walking with you so that when you stumble, they can catch you before you fall? And if you should fall, help you back up. Choose to overcome temptation in your life. Be specific, sincere, and selfless. So, here's the challenge for you this week. If temptation is as common as the Bible says, what are you tempted with right now? Are you tempted by not wearing this when really you should be wearing it? I mean, we're all sick of wearing masks, right? But some of us are more tempted than others to just throw it out when really that's not the loving thing that we're supposed to be doing. And maybe that's an area of temptation. And there's other areas, all sorts of areas. Whatever that area is right now that you're being tempted by, sit down, journal, diary, whatever, write down what specifically you're being tempted with right now. And then, how do you selflessly get past that in God? How do you triumph over that? Connect with somebody, make a decision. If you want to make a decision and text that number, that'd be great. I would love to follow up with you this week. Make a decision for God. It's the greatest decision you can make because he is for us. He wants us to triumph. He's on our side. As I talked about over the last couple of weeks, God has, has given to us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need. He's given us his very nature by his spirit. If you're a, a person in relationship with God through Jesus, then you have everything you need. God has given it to us. We just need to access it. We just need to run to him and run to him and one another too because the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead isn't just in me, it's in my brothers and sisters. And nobody has it all. We need each other. That's God's design. So, what are you going to overcome this week in Jesus? And then, share that with somebody because we're not supposed to walk it out alone. All right, a couple things to conclude with. Let me pray for you first here. I just want to pray for us. There's a lot of temptation facing all sorts of people. I mean, we've got brothers and sisters in the nation to the south being tempted by all sorts of thoughts as they face an election on Tuesday. Uh, we have all sorts of temptation all over the world as, as people choose to be tempted into violence in response to grief and trauma in their life and anxiety in their lives. We've got people that are struggling with their health. And uh, I just heard this morning about one of our uh, congregation members, her dad, has just had a, a, a sad sort of, uh, not sort of, a sad medical report. And they're trying to sort through that too. And, and we just want to pray. We need to go to God. God is the answer. God is the one who is absolutely for us and wants us to triumph in life. And so I just want to pray for us all today in that way. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning saying, help, we are all tempted. Lord, we all face temptation. Lord, sometimes it's temptation, Lord, to, to satisfy proper desires in wrong ways. Sometimes, Lord, it is evil desires that we've inherited. Sometimes, Lord, it's, it's wrong desires that we've developed in our lives through bad habits. But Lord, I just pray right now that everyone here and watching online would experience your presence and your power today to overcome. 
The Bible says that you have made us more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. I pray that we would all choose Jesus, all make a decision for Jesus, and all chase after Jesus with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, completely and without reservation. I pray, Lord, that, that we would overcome our selfishness in life and find the true love and life that you entire, in, intended us to live, abundantly, joyfully. I pray, Lord, that as we move through this week, God, that you would touch our lives, touch, Lord, people needing healing in their physical bodies. Touch people struggling emotionally, Lord. There's a lot of emotional anxiety going on right now as we're going through this pandemic and people desiring it to be over. And God, I pray for it to be over soon. Lord, get us through this. But at the same time, Lord, we're not wanting to check out. We're wanting to check in with you and make our way through this, Lord, showing your love and your grace to others and revealing you to the world. I pray, Lord, that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen.